Uh, good afternoon to you all, uh, those who are present here and those who have joined us online. On behalf of uh, International Center for Theoretical Sciences, ICTS, and Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium, I extend a, a very warm welcome to you all, and uh, especially the speaker for today's program, uh, Professor Shishir. Uh, a warm welcome to you, sir. Um, so we seem to be coming out of our homes post-pandemic, and uh, these offline programs are picking up in attendance. And we would like to see in uh, uh, greater numbers in the coming months. We hope uh, those who are joining us online today uh, would be present here offline because uh, the excitement of listening to somebody in flesh and blood and interacting and having a, co a copy uh, more than anything else uh, and having a discussion informally with the speaker outside, that's a kind of an experience which has to be uh, felt. So we expect all the online people also to convert and come to offline programs in the coming months. So today's topic is uh, uh, history of walking robots. So walking robots, very interesting. Walking humans are also equally interesting because we don't understand much about walking humans as much as we do about walking robots. And uh, the two are interrelated. And um, this must be a very, very interesting talk. So once again, we welcome you, sir. And I now request uh, Professor Joseph Samuel to introduce the speaker to the audience uh, before he starts the talk. Thank you. Animelargu Hardika Swagata. Welcome to all of you to this in-person copy. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, I'd like to say a few words about a program which the ICTS has started. The ICTS, in collaboration with the Planetarium, have been running this copy with curiosity. And then we get interested members of the public who are, uh, well, fond of thinking about science and related questions. Now. We're starting a new initiative, apart from the ones that we already have, and it's called the Math Circle India. The Math Circle is an idea in which we try to get young people who have an aptitude for mathematics and encourage them to develop their talents with some mentors. So those of you who are interested in mathematics, please stay back after this, um, after this talk to see a, watch a small video about how to go about applying for it. You'll also see that mathematics can be fun, and it need not be a competitive activity, as often happens in schools and exams. But it can be something which is creative, and you do with your friends for fun, just like you play Frisbee with them. Now, about today's talk, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Shashir, who, is, uh, who works on intelligent walking robots. And uh, he has done his uh, bachelor's from Warangal University, I mean, from Warangal, the Regional Engineering College. And then he went on to work at Texas A&M and at MIT. And his professional area is to develop walking robots. Now, walking is something that we all do for pleasure. We go out in the morning walk. And it's something that doctors advise us to do. But as we just heard, it's not as easy as you think. It's very hard to make a machine walk as easily as it is for us to just pick up a leg and move it around. So this subject has actually de uh, developed because of artificial intelligence, and that's what he's going to talk to us about. Now, the subject had to do with neural networks. That was initially an idea that physicists used to describe glasses. They th thought of glasses as being spins coupled with some couplings. And over the years, people turned it around and said, if we cannot use our brains to understand glass, Perhaps we can use glass to understand our brains. And that led to the field of artificial intelligence and machines which you can teach to think. So today, Shishir is going to tell us about the machines who are starting to, who can be taught to think and perhaps to walk. So without further ado, I hand the stage over to Shishir. Back there. All right. Thanks a lot for the introduction. And also thanks a lot for uh, the JNTAT Auditorium Committee, ICTS, 
and everybody involved uh, to make this happen. Um, it's, a, it's obviously, you know, it's always an honor and a pleasure for me to talk about my research to the general public. Uh, it's not that, I, that easy, believe me. <laughs> if this were to be a room full of experts, walking experts, I can use all the terminologies that I can think of, right, and still be, you know, hoping that at least there is a percentage of the audience that will understand what I'm talking about, right? When it comes to the general audience, um, it's not that easy, it's very difficult, right? Because talking about these uh, facts, these concepts in layman's terms, it's a skill, not, a, not everybody will have that skill. Okay. So, history of walking robots, uh, that's the topic of uh, today's uh, presentation. Uh, you see two robots over there, uh, this is called stock two, this is called stock three, stock as in S-T-O-C-H. There's a long history behind why we call it S-T-O-C-H, stock. It's a weird name, I agree, but there's a history behind it. Uh, these, these are the two robots that were developed in IISC, uh, in Bangalore, in India, uh, to be very precise. Uh, and we are currently working on this. We, we are talking about, we are actually using learning-based controllers to get walking in this robot. Right? Okay, so before I begin, as we all know, we don't really see walking robots, right? Commonly see walking robots out, out there. So my first step in every presentation is to justify why we have to use walking robots. So why walking robots? Um, there are several ways to explain it. Um, today I'm going to use this way of explaining it. Uh, so there are a lot of features that we can think of. For example, fall recovery. If the robot falls down, can it get up by itself? Rough terrain navigation, right? Any kind of terrain, including slopes, upslopes, downslopes, staircases, sand terrains, right? Gravels, all kinds of terrains that you can think of. Autonomous navigation, very similar to autonomous cars. Live streaming, I can send this robot to a remote area and get live feed. Uh, identification detection, this is very important for security purposes. Uh, teleoperation, leader follower, follower. Leader follower is very interesting. I want this ro robot to be like my pet dog. Uh, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Quiet operation, quite unlike the drones that you see, right? Drones are very, very noisy. This is very quiet, no noise at all. So if we can think of an application where all these features are useful, or maybe a few of these features are useful, we can think of using this walking robot platform. That is a justification. Right? Okay, so with that justification, I have to talk about this robot, right? There's a lot of talk in the internet about this robot. Uh, this is by Tesla. Uh, Tesla, they have developed their own humanoid. And I have to admit, it's quite impressive, the speed at which they got this to work. Uh, but the controller that is in use here is still nothing compared to this robot. What is this robot? This is the robot called Atlas from Boston Dynamics. Boston Dynamics is a, is a company based out of Boston, obviously, uh, USA. And uh, their main goal is to get these kinds of behaviors, really dynamic behaviors uh, in all kinds of platforms. You can see the kind of coordination that they are having, right? This is, this is, these are not trivial kind of behaviors, right? You see the foot on the floor, the tap, the tap, right? The tap using the foot and the slip and that, uh, you know, these kinds of moves are not at all trivial, right? This is not something that, uh, you know, that we can do just like that. And they are not only doing this with one robot, they are doing it with two robots, three robots. One more robot will come in eventually. So in the interest of time, let me pause here. Let me just talk about, uh, sorry. Le so let me talk about, uh, a little bit about the Boston Dynamics. Um, this video is on the, uh, on the internet if you want to watch it fully. 
So what is this Boston Dynamics? Okay, it was founded in 1992 by Mark Rayward. Uh, Hyundai acquired it recently for a billion dollars. So it's a billion dollar worth company at least. Um, it has operated more as a well-funded research lab than a business. So since 1992, focus was more on R&D, research lab, right? And so far they have spent at least $150 million, right? Just to get these things working, right? Now they are a, they are a 100 plus employee company trying to look at different applications, especially with their four-legged version, right? But think about it. Can I approach a VC firm in Bangalore <laughs> say that I have a startup with no revenues, zero revenues, and expect $150 million? Certainly not. And uh, it's the same logic there also. This, this has been funded by the defense, the DARPA of the US. Uh, so they have funded heavily on this project, and the result of that 30-year-long investment is this company, right, is this robot. So if you want to emulate something like this in this country, maybe we should look at Boston Dynamics. This is very important. Okay, we are in 2022, I should be talking about AI, right? Artificial intelligence. So there is a parallel group of researchers focused entirely on developing walking controllers using deep learning techniques. And this is what this video is. So this video is by Google DeepMind uh, and they use something known as reinforcement learning. So what is reinforcement learning? Let's say I want to go to a certain location. Let's say I want to go there, right, towards the exit. Now this platform will have maybe a few joints, right, few actuators, uh, limbs, maybe legs, hands, or whatever it is, right? And the idea is I won't tell this system, this robot, how to go there, right? How to coordinate your limbs. I just tell the system you have to go there. If you go there, I will give you some reward, right? So it's like a reward-based incentive to make it learn by itself. So that is the key here. We don't tell the robot how to go there. The robot has to learn how to go there. It has to figure it out. In other words, it has to figure out how to coordinate its joints, its links, right, hands, arms, right? It has to figure everything out by itself and go to the destination, right? This is not what Boston Dynamics is doing, right? They do not use reinforcement learning in any format to get those kinds of behaviors, right? There is a big gap. But having said that, as soon as this video got released, I think this was around 2016 or 17, I don't remember exactly, uh, there was a lot of, there is a lot of talk about AI taking over the domain of robotics, right, having these kinds of behaviors. Google, Google uh, actually owned Boston Dynamics for a brief period of time, if you are not aware, and then they sold it off, right? And the reasoning was kind of very similar. We can get these behaviors just by using deep learning. I think that's a wrong statement to make. They have not made this statement officially, but that is the indication that we get, of course. Uh, so I need to be accurate, right? Uh, so, so can we do something like this in a robot? We have to understand that there is a big difference between getting it to work in simulation versus getting it to work in a real platform, hardware platform. And that is where the difference is. We can get all of this working in a simulator, but not in hardware, right? To give you the real scenario, so here is a video. Uh, think, imagine an outsider entering a robotics company and trying to take videos, and this is exactly what it is, right? Boston Dynamics, remember, they make their own videos, right? So they have the choice. They will take, a few, they'll have a few takes, and they will pick one, the best one, and upload it on YouTube, and that's what we see, right? Now, this is how a robot would look like, right? Any robotics company you enter, this is the scenario, this is the reality, right? Even in my lab, if you come with a camera in my lab, right, I would be very careful. <laughs> will the robot work, will the robot not work? There is no guarantee because these are all research platforms and uh, getting it to work thousand out of thousand times, right? I'm not saying one out of 10 times, one out of 100 times. I'm talking about uh, several times. Almost every time it has to work. That is not really the case, right? That is also the reason why we don't have Boston Dynamics humanoid Right, out here serving coffee, for example, serving copy <laughs> after the end of the talk. So there is a big difference. So we are still a long way from full-scale realization, full-scale deployment of these robotic platforms in the real world, right? Even if we have achieved dancing, there is still a long gap. 
Okay, now let's get back to the talk. Um, no matter what it is, right? Boston Dynamics, Tesla, my lab, right? Or any robotics company that you can think of, especially in the domain of walking. Uh, although this is true in general for any domain, uh, but let's stick to walking for this talk. The goal is just this. We need a robot that is at least as good as a human because we don't ha still have a robot that is as good as a human, that can walk as good as a human, e not, not even now, right? So there is still a long way to go. Okay. So what are the approaches that are used for walking? Uh, so like I said, it's very difficult for a researcher to keep the language simple. Uh, so these are all the terminologies that are used. You know, I know it is next to impossible to explain the whole thing to you in 10 minutes. Right? It's not at all possible, but I will try my best, right? And I'll try, I, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, so let's start with this. So we have zero moment point. We have spring-loaded inverted pendulum models. These capture points, passive dynamic walking, hybrid zero dynamics. So these are all the techniques that have been developed since the 1960s, 50s, all the way till 2000s, 2010s. And each one has its own value. Each one has pros and cons, <coughs> positives and negatives to take from. And uh, my hope is that, you know, at least you'll get some of it, if not all of it, right? So this will be, okay. So before I get to the, the actual history, uh, I also wanted to talk about uh, the recent advances. So on the left side, we have this robot. Let me need to reduce the volume, okay. So on the left side, we have this robot from MIT. It's called the Mini Cheetah. And on the right hand side, we have uh, this robot called Animal, A-N-Y-M-A-L, Animal. Uh, so the right one is from ETH Zurich. Left side is from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, they have shown really remarkable behaviors, as good as Boston Dynamics types of behaviors. Uh, and what's interesting is that their methods are completely different. On the left hand side, we have something known as model predictive control. It's a very long term, model predictive control. On the right hand side, reinforcement learning. I talked about reinforcement learning just a while ago. They use reinforcement learning methods, right? Uh, and it's not just as simple as saying they're they use reinforcement learning methods. They have a set of layers and they have to play with that to get it to work. Uh, so it's a long process, but these are considered the state of the art right now, right? Uh, in fact, in, even in my lab, uh, we actually focus on using these methods, both of these methods, a combination of them to get really successful walking behaviors. So I will talk about this also towards the end of the talk, right? So here is the outline. So it has two parts. One is the history, history of walking. Uh, this will be probably 30 minutes, maybe. Uh, and the second part is uh, what is happening in our lab in IISE. Uh, like I said, we use a lot of learning-based techniques uh, to get walking. So that will be approximately 15 minutes, right? So that is the, the split up. Okay, so let's start with the history of walking. History is, you know, as always the case, it's very difficult to ac accurately portray, right? because unless you have strong evidence, it's really hard to say what happened, right? It's the same with walking. We don't know when people started looking at walking. Maybe it happened in the 15th century or the 10th century or the 15th century or even way before, right? Before we even realized, uh, you know, we, even before we invented the wheel perhaps, we don't know. But this is one strong evidence uh, where people were actually looking at uh, walking, walking behaviors, trotting behaviors, galloping behaviors in horses, right? Why am I saying this? Because this was for the first time, this is when motion capture was used to study horse gates. Uh, so this happened in 1870s, where uh, this person called uh, Stanford, Leland Stanford, Stanford is the governor of California, and uh, if you know Stanford University, so he created it, uh, he was the originator. Uh, so he, he got in a photographer and he said, I want to understand uh, if the horses have a flight gate, flight phase or not. When, when I say flight phase, all the four feet are up in air. 
right? So he, he got a photographer and the photographer did this analysis and then said, yes, it does have a flight face, right? And not only that, he started documenting a lot of other kinds of behaviors, like the jumping behaviors and so on and so forth, right? So that was, this was like the first use case of using motion, motion capture to understand human, not human, sorry, horse walking behaviors, right? So immediately after that, 1893, uh, this person called Lewis A. Rigg, he created this mechanical horse. So it's actually quite simple. So we have these pedals here. We turn the pedals, this gear turns, right? And this gear in turn will turn these two smaller gears and that's why you will have this cyclic motion of the legs, right? Uh, surprisingly, he never created this. He never made this. He, he wrote the design and he filed for a patent, right? I used to think at least during the old times, all the patents used to be genuine. <laughs> But that's not really the case. But uh, you know, this is kind of important because you know he came up with a way to you know convert the circular motion into back forth motion, right? Uh, but it's important that you know th these are all mechanical designs, mechanisms that we can think of. By 1950s, it was clear that you know just playing with the mechanical designs is not enough. We need control, right? We need control. We need to decide what kind of torque, for example, we can apply for, e for each and every joint. This is important. So that's when we can think about uh, the G walking truck. One of the earliest attempts to imitate the four-legged motion of animals was this walking truck built by General Electric in the USA as far back as 1965. A human operator was suspended in the body and he gave the commands to each of the legs through a hydraulic system that followed the movements of his arms and legs. machine was capable of quite impressive feats in the laboratory, tossing a jeep out of the way, for example. But the strain of thinking about which leg to move next exhausted the operator after about 15 minutes, and he had... So let me pause there. there so, so the lady said after 15 minutes of operating it, the person gets exhausted and he needs rest, right? This is kind of important because for each and every joint there, there would be a liver and he has to play with all of these knobs, right? There were just too many knobs to play with. So it, it became increasingly difficult to get, operate this machine as time progressed. But whatever it is, you know, this was one of the few examples where control was actually used for getting locomotion, right? Uh, and more importantly, uh, this notion called statically stable walking was used. So what is this statically stable walking? Uh, you think of a table, it has four legs, it is static, it is not falling down. So it is statically stable, right? It's the same analogy. So we can have a tripod, three legs, we can have four legs or even more. We know it's not going to topple over, right? But when will it topple over? When the center of its, when the center of the table, we call it the center of mass, is outside the support region, right? So what is the support region? So you can think of these as four legs. Right, left front, right front, left rear, right rear, right? Now, let's say the goal is to move the center forward, correct? So you would do it one step at a time. You would lift one leg at a time, right? That is like the straightforward approach. So let's say you lift right rear. So now it is supported by only three legs, correct? So that's why we see a triangle here, right? Now, as long as this dot, which is the center, we call it the center of mass, is inside this, we call it the convex, convex hull. We call it the convex hull. Uh, as long as it, it is within the support polygon, convex polygon, because of the legs, we know that it's not going to topple over, right? So we call it then, th that's when we call it statically stable walking behavior, right? So we do the same here. The leg was lifted, now it is back on ground, right? But now it is forward a little bit. So now we will lift the right front right leg, right? Now we have a triangle again. It will go forward. Right? So we do this one step at a time and we have motion of the robot, correct? So statically stable walking. But is that what we do? No, right? So why do you think uh, we don't use statically stable? Our gate is not statically stable. What is the reason? Dynamics. Dynamics, right? Because think about it. I'm standing on one leg. What's the guarantee that this center is actually right below, right? 
it could be forward, and I just need to figure out where to put my next leg, right? So we are actually dynamically stable. We are not statically stable uh, beings, right? Two, yeah. So even with these two legs, my center of mass can still be outside the support polygon, correct? So that is when this person called Vuko Bratovich, 1969, um, he said, we don't need static stability. He said, okay, let's, let's figure out a way to, you know, make sure that there is no rollover of this toe, right? As long as I'm not rolling over of my toe at any point of time, I don't think it is going to fall down. So that's what he said, right? So in other words, he said, as long as there is no twisting action here. So when I say twisting, I mean moment, right? As long as that moment is zero, that's why zero moment, right? I'm okay. I'm dynamically stable, right? I don't really have to worry if the center of mass, look at the center of mass. The center of mass is right here. It's actually in front of this leg, in front of the foot, right? So this is very important because now as long as my point, we call it the zero moment point is within this, we are fine, right? So that's why we call it the zero moment point. As long as I have a controller, which will ensure that the moment here is always zero, I'm okay. I'm able to walk comfortably, right? So now you notice Tesla robot. So they showed walking and you can take a guess as to what type of technique they were using. So you, you can also notice that the knees are kind of bent, right? Why do you think that is the case? Because they're trying to keep the foot flat all the time. So it's like this. Try to walk with your foot flat all the time. Don't, don't make your foot roll over like this. Make it flat all the time. So you will automatically tend to bend your knees, right? So I mean, they're not saying this explicitly, but looking at the video, we can say that they're using a 1970s, 1980s old technique called the zero moment point, right? So that's why I'm saying they still have a long way to go if they want to reach the level of Boston Dynamics. It's the same with this robot. Any guesses as to which robot this is? Honda's Asimo, right? They were, they had this robot in the 1990s, 2000s, and they were also using the same technique. Look at the knees again, bent knees, right? So it's like I'm always walking like this, <laughs> right? So it is dynamically stable, which is okay, but we are still not there. Because again, that's not how we walk. We always use our body as the template. Yeah. Uh, I was, I remember that Honda's Asimo had a very short battery life. I don't know exactly, but I think it is less than 30 minutes. I think that's what it was. A very short battery life and uh, even the demonstrations used to be very, very short. It's not, because, so that's the reason, yeah, it's not energetically, it's not efficient. That is also one of the reasons why. And that's the reason why the battery would die very fast. Okay, so that's when the founder of Boston Dynamics comes in, Mark Raybert. Um, and if you look at his history, it's kind of very, very interesting. While people were focusing on walking with two legs, four legs, with feet, he said, okay, I'm going to focus on only one leg and no feet, right? No feet, one leg. And that is the result of this. So I'm going to let this the video play. The calculated where the legs should move to to keep it balanced. Like all Raybert's dynamic robots, they had to keep moving to stay on their feet. His dynamic robots performed amazing feats. Right, so he started with one leg, and then he extended the same controller for multiple legs. So irrespective of the number of legs, if you have walking or hopping, so he was focused on hopping, he was not focused on walking. Uh, using hopping behaviors, you know, it, it was like a spring, so he had a spring on the leg, and it would keep on hopping all the time. 
right? And if you get it working in one leg, his philosophy was you should be able to get it in any number of legs, right? And that's what he's showing here. And he follows very, very simple principles. So this is the one leg hopper that he started with. He follows three principles. One is hopping control. So create a trajectory or a cycle, cyclic behavior, like the hopper would go up and down, right? The leg would go up and down. So that is a cyclic behavior which results in hopping. So that is the first rule. Second rule, forward speed control. Measure the velocity of your torso. If I'm going, if I have a velocity in this direction, you know that the hopper leg has to be pointed in this direction, right? So that you can recover, right? So depending on the direction of the velocity, the direction of that leg would be oriented accordingly. The third one is posture control. Identify the angle of your torso. Roll, pitch, yaw, whatever it is. Apply a torque accordingly, right? Try to correct your torso. So if you follow these three simple rules, you'll get hopping behaviors. Having said that, it's not as simple as saying these three simple rules. There is a lot of tuning that is involved. In fact, it's a lot of tuning. If you try it yourself, uh, it goes a long way. But once you get it working, you will have really, really, really incredible behaviors, right? And that's why we have these hopping behaviors, right? So now with that, I wanted to shift gears a little bit in a parallel direction. So there is this person called Tad McGear. Uh, so he was not really looking at, you know, these kinds of, you know, reactive type of behaviors. He wanted to still use the physics, the, the mechanical principles. So I'm going to let the person himself explain the whole thing because he obviously explains it better than me. This familiar toy is a passive dynamic walker with energy supplied by a falling weight and the right start. It settles into a steady walking cycle sustained by an entirely passive interaction of gravity and inertia. This machine is also a passive dynamic walker. For that matter, I may be a passive dynamic walker. As you'll see, our gates are quite similar. The cabal is running the day when the analysis and my intuition were brought conclusively into line. So he said, that my analysis and intuition were, brought, were both brought into line, right? And this was the result of that. So he did a lot of calculations, mainly on uh, the, the mechanical design of it, right? Once his calculation was right, he was able to get it to walk down a ramp, right? So what is this all about? Uh, so you think of this four leg, the number of legs are not important. So you think of these four legs, right? And let's say you want this, this figure to go down the ramp, correct? Something like this. Now, the idea is to, you know, design your links, the mass properties, the lens, whatever it is, in such a way that it keeps on going down. In other words, simply use gravity to make it go down, nothing else, all right? If you are able to do it, and that's what he showed, you can actually, you're, you're able to, you can actually design your robot in such a way that it goes down the slope continuously, forever. If you're able to do it, then you have sustained walking down the slope, right? And not only that, you are only using gravity, nothing else, right? So in other words, the energy consumed is minimal because you are using gravity only, right? So if you're able to convert this into flat ground walking, in other words, whatever forces that were in action down the slope, if you're able to emulate that on a flat ground, you will have sustained walking on the flat ground as well, right? So this is what uh, McGear and then Spong, Mark Spong, extended it for the flat ground, ground terrain. And he said, okay, if you're able to get this downslope walking, you can also get the same on a horizontal plane, right? Now, the key idea here is to not to, you know, achieve, apply a reactive type of a controller. The goal is to design your robot in such a way that you will have a periodic behavior, right? So we call it a periodic behavior, a cyclic motion, correct? And that's the main goal here. So in other words, he's saying, if you have, listen carefully, I can actually play the video if you want. He says, we think of walking as periodic in nature, right? It's like a cyclic nature, like an oscillation, continuous oscillation. And that's what walking is all about. And if we are able to do this for a downslope walking, we can also do the same for a flat ground walking. Okay, so all that was done. Now, uh, a few years down the line, 
uh, this person called Jerry Pratt uh, at IHMC. IHMC is in Florida. Uh, he started using capture points. So what is this capture points? It's actually a, an, an advanced method compared to Raybird's controller. So we have Raybird's controller, which requires a lot of tuning. He actually took it to another level by using the notion of capture points. So what is this capture points? I'm going to play the video again. The capture region is the region on the ground in which the robot must place its center of pressure in order to stop. As long as the capture region intersects the support polygon, the robot can stay balanced. Once the capture region no longer intersects the support polygon, the robot must take a step in order to regain balance. In order to walk, the robot moves its center of pressure on its foot to guide the estimated capture region towards the desired location to step. The robot then swings its leg, stepping into the capture region and transferring support into the new stance leg. During double support, the robot transfers its center of pressure on the trailing foot to the toe, resulting in toe off. Okay, I don't know how much of it you were able to understand. So his idea was something like this. Let's say, let me put that slide. Okay, let's say I apply a force on the torso, right? So I was standing with two feet and a force is being applied behind me, right? Now I need to think of putting my foot in such a way that I will stand right there, right? I sh in other words, I reduce the velocity down to zero, right? I started with a non-zero velocity, and the velocity has to go to zero. So if I'm pushed in this direction, I would be putting my foot in such a way that all of the support, all of my center of mass, all of my body is entirely on the support, right? That is the idea. So you identify these capture points wherever you, wherever you are, right? Depending on the current state, you identify where this capture region is, and then you put your foot there, right? So capture region is a region where the foot is placed in such a way that the robot ends up balancing with that foot. Correct? Identify this region. And then put your foot there. And you know that with that foot itself, you are able to balance this robot. Right? So that is the idea. And with this capture region method, they, there are three modes. Mode number one. When the capture region intersects with the base support of the foot, you are fine. Because you are already supported. When the capture region and support are disjoint, that is when you have to put your foot towards that region. So you will have to put this foot over here, for example. When the capture region is really far, so that's when we say it is outside the leg workspace area, it's very far, you have to take multiple steps to reach to that capture region, right? So using this method of capture points, we are able to get different kinds of behaviors in the robot, right? So that is about capture points. Now, whatever it is, uh, so I have shown a few methods it is definitely not exhaustive, right? There are many other methods that are in literature. Uh, but whatever it is, you know, we are seeing a, a common trend. And the trend is something like this. The controller will have two types. We'll have two parts. Reactive control, trajectory or gate tracking control. What is this reactive control? Mainly focused on realizing recovery type of actions, right? Capture point is one example, right? Similarly, Raybird's controller is another example. Trajectory tracking control, Tad McGear, right? Periodic orbits, periodic cycles. That is a great example for this, right? Now, it's all about finding the right combination of a trajectory, a gate, and a reactive mechanism, right? So you can think of a reactive mechanism whenever there is an external disturbance, like an, ex like a, like an external push. You can think of periodic behaviors, right? Whenever you want to have a sustained motion, correct? So these are the two types. Now, all the controllers that you see is actually a combination of this. And some are more focused on reactive strategy, like Raybird's control, and some are more focused on getting gates, cycles, which is passive walking is one of them, right? And both are extremely hard to realize, right? The conclusion of the entire talk is that walking is hard. <laughs> Walking controller, in addition to that, walking controller in simulation, a working controller in simulation does not imply we have a working controller in hardware, right? So even if you get it working in a simulator, it does not mean that you have really gotten it to work in the hardware. There is still a long path ahead. Okay, so I just wanted to talk. Uh, so I said working controller in simulation does not imply working controller in hardware, right? 
So I just wanted to show you some videos as to why this is actually very important. Uh, so this, this robot that I'm going to play, uh, so was a robot that I was working on actually when I was doing my PhD, uh, a running robot. And, and uh, we have a working controller in simulation, we tested on hardware, it fails, right? So we have tested a lot of these controllers. And finally, I think it was more than 40 or 50 controllers that we have tested on the hardware itself. So all of the controllers that we are, we are testing on the hardware works in a simulator, but it does not work on the hardware. Right? And finally, one controller will work, and that will be your final result, <laughs> your PhD dissertation. <laughs> right? Like I said, Boston Dynamics makes their own video and uploads it on YouTube. Right? So you don't really know what really took to make that happen. Right? It's the same analogy here. We have hundreds of experiments, and one experiment runs. Right? And once you have captured it in a video, you don't have to run the experiments in an infinite loop. You can just play the video <laughs> in an infinite loop, right? But you cannot really do this when, we, when, it talk, when it comes to real world deployment of these platforms, right? So that is where the gap is. Okay, now let's come to what we have been doing in IAC, the walking robot lab called the Stochastic Robotics Lab. Uh, like I mentioned, there is a lot of learning that is involved. Uh, there are several reasons behind it. I gave you one of the reasons uh, at the beginning. Uh, one of the biggest reasons is we don't have to tell the robot how to go there, right? We just tell the robot go there and the robot has to figure it out by itself. And if it's able to do it, that's fantastic. That's what we want. And that's what we are trying to incorporate here. And uh, I have put two terminologies, linear policies and foot trajectories, right? So you can think of this as a reactive controller and you can think of this as a gate tracking, gate controller, right? Two modules are required, and we use learning in both of them. And the result of that is robust walking. Stock one, stock two, stock light. So these are the first three versions. Uh, just wanted to show you the robots, stock one, stock two, stock three. And um, we started this uh, in 2017, 2018. In fact, this was in collaboration with the three other faculty so it was not just me who started this. Three other faculty were also involved. Uh, Bharadwa, Jamrutur, Shalab, Bhatnagar, Ashitava, Goshal. So they're all from IAC. And in fact, they have different backgrounds. Bharadwa from communications, Shalab from computer science, and Ashitava, Goshal from mechanical engineering. So different disciplines coming together. And that's exactly what we need for, for a domain like this. Uh, we, we were very cost sensitive less than $5,000 per robot. In fact, this is very important for a country like India. And we have achieved state-of-the-art controllers. I will show in a few minutes. This is stock two, developed in 2020 during the COVID times. And uh, this is a very small robot. Uh, it's able to go forward, backward. In fact, the person behind, standing behind, is having a joystick controller and he's controlling the robot. And it's able to have, it's able to walk forward, backward, turn left, right, sidestep, and so on and so forth. Right? Uh, this is our most recent version, it's called Stock 3. Uh, total weight of 25 kilograms, uh, payload of 5 kilograms, and the speed 0.6 meters per second. Reasonably okay for us. Um, these are the early results of stock three. So we are actually doing force control, pitch down, pitch up, roll left, roll right, right? So all these kinds of behaviors. So we test these controllers to, before we test walking on this robot. Seems to be more fluid. Okay, so what are the goals of this project? Goals of the stocking, stock walking project? Like I said, we are cost sensitive, right? We are working because components, Robotic parts have to be cheap in a country like India, right? It's very hard to beat the market. So cost sensitivity is actually very important. And when it comes to that, you know, there's a lot of research that we can do. Uh, so we are talking about low compute controllers for these types of robots. In fact, that's the reason why I keep saying linear policies. Linear, nonlinear, if you are familiar with these terminologies. Linear is like a simple matrix. We multiply the matrix with the states, we get the actions, we get the controls. 
Nonlinear would be very complicated and it requires a lot of computation, right? So linearity is actually very important and that actually brings down the computational overhead. We can use a very simple, very tiny controller, right, instead of a very complex controller. So this is using linear policies, right? And we, we do learning. So like I said, we use reinforcement learning and we use a very specific methodology called the evolutionary methods. So we use evolutionary strategy to learn a good linear policy. So we can think of it that way. So these are the two goals, right? Automatically learn walking and at the same time keep the computation low. So how do we do this? So remember, we have a little bit of actuation, we have a little bit of sensing. Uh, for example, so what is actuation? Joint command, right? Angle should be two degrees, three degrees. That is one action. There are also other types of actions. What is sensing? Sensing could be my torso angle, for example. I want to know where my torso is, how angled it is, right? That is my sensing. Using these sensors, I calculate the reward. And then I tell the policy, oh, okay, this is what the reward is. Let's adjust our controller accordingly, right? So this is what reinforcement learning is all about, right? So we come up with a better policy, better policy parameter theta in this case, to come up with a better walking controller, right? Now using this reinforcement learning, I mentioned, I mentioned that Google is very much interested in using reinforcement learning for walking. So they have an entire lab dedicated towards achieving this, right? This is from Google, uh, this is from Google. So they developed a controller that can work, work on this robot, this little robot, it's called the Minotaur robot. They, they got really interesting behaviors with this robot, right? Similarly, we have this robot from uh, ETH Zurich. So they also use heavy reinforcement learning. In fact, they have a huge simulation platform where they tested on thousand different robots, right? Finally, arrive at a good policy. However, the existing simulation methods cannot accurately capture the dynamics. It's in simulation. Yeah. Consequently, a policy trained only in simulation. So you can notice this robot is down there, right? The dynamics of robots can be represented as shown in this visual. I will let it finish. The mechanics, blue circle, can be represented by rigid body dynamics, which is fairly well understood. However, the rest of the dynamics is too complicated to model accurately with traditional approaches. To this end, we train a neural network representing this complex dynamics with data from the real robot. A policy trained in a simulation that includes the rigid body dynamics and an actuator network can be transferred to the real robot. Here, we train a locomotion policy. So here we can see different behaviors. Velocity. Right, so they are testing it in the simulator and finally deploy it on the hardware, right? And that's what they're trying to show here. We can also but there are several advantages, there are several positives to take from this approach, right? One is the ease of use. Uh, there is a huge explosion in the domain of AI. Without because of that, there are tools like TensorFlow, Torch, simulators, real system. E even the processing compute, Compared the compute power, everything has improved robot, significantly. The train right? policy makes this is not true precisely. in classical walking well, robot domain. This is something, this was something unthinkable for the other side, right? But for the reinforcement learning, the deep learning side, this is all readily available, right? Not only that, the kind of online support that you get, online resources that you get is huge. So you can actually deploy all of these controllers, right, on the fly. You can see this. So they are also testing robustness tests on this robot, right? So all of this is controllers developed Animal through deep reinforcement learning before. techniques. The train policy okay. meets the previous So now an another advantage. This extremely complicated recovery task. Another benefit, which is actually very important. We don't talk about exploration at all using the classical methods. Reinforcement learning is a way in which you can actually do exploration. You can explore different types of controllers, right? This is what ev even humans typically do. We, we have this tendency to explore different possibilities, right? And finally, we arrive at a good controller. And that is something that we can actually apply using reinforcement learning, right? So this is one example. So we have done a similar, we, we do reinforcement learning on this robot. So this is our first version called stock one. And after four hours of training, it's able to walk comfortably, right? I don't tell the robot what the model is. There is no notion of zero moment point, for example, capture points, 
all of these terminologies that I introduced previously, right? I just tell the robot, this is the reward. You go forward, I'll give you a high reward. And this is how it is able to figure it out, right? Having said that, it's also good to look at the history of walking also, right? Because you can take a lot of inputs from it. We got this working in simulation, right? But, but the problem is still there. We still have not deployed it on the hardware, right? It's still not there. And that's the reason why we still have to look at the classical methods to take help as to how to deploy these types of controllers on the hardware. And for that, I'm going to show this video, going to play this video. This is actually a very interesting video. Uh, people use it all the time. If you go to any walking conference, one out of the 10 presentations will have this. So what is this video? So this is a cat walking on a treadmill. Looking at the cat, it seems like everything is fine with the cat. But that is not really the case because this cat is actually having a severed spine. In other words, the connection between the brain and the spinal cord is very limited, very, very limited, right? So with that kind of communication break, we cannot really expect, like how can we expect this cat to walk comfortably on a treadmill? So that is like a big question, right? So the argument was, all of the heavy lifting is actually done by the spinal cord, right? And th that was the argument made in this paper. So all of the heavy lifting is happening in the spinal cord. The brain only sends the high level commands. That is the idea, right? The brain will tell the spinal cord, okay, I want to go to that location, high level command, right? Or go forward. So that is the idea. And all the tracking, for example, gate generation, everything is happening at the low level. And that is what we need to also do here, right? If you are talking about using learning-based techniques, even a cat learns how to walk eventually, right? But what is it that it is actually trying to learn? It is trying to learn a trajectory, right? So that is the idea. So we need to think of learning trajectories. So your actions, your controllers should be designed in such a way that you find a good trajectory. Right? If you want to go there, you need to find a trajectory. Right? So this has a very strong correlation with, with that gate controller that I showed previously. Right? We, we talk about passive dynamics, we talk about capture points and whatnot. So their trajectory was like a very important component of it. It's the same here. So we, even if you do learning, we have to look at trajectories. And that is the argument. So to, to give you like a, you know, a, a view of what is actually happening. So this is our RL framework. And let's say this is a, our trajectory. So we can think of these four trajectories as the trajectories for the foot. So the, the, each foot has to do something like this, right? So this is an ellipse. So it has to follow this trajectory, right? Now, the idea is to use this RL framework to shape these trajectories, right? So we start with this ellipse. Eventually, we'll end up getting something like this, right? And finally, this could be our trajectory. But I don't tell the robot what trajectory it is. It has to still discover the right trajectory for itself, right? And that is the key. And using this technique, we can get behaviors, right? So that is using, so that is why we said it's a trajectory-based reinforcement learning technique, right? Instead of using a direct actuator, we have a trajectory generator, and that applies the actions to the robot, right? So we have an extra module. Okay, so we have a trajectory generator, and it's all about shaping the trajectories, right? And to shape the trajectories, we will use a linear policy. So that is the argument that we made in our own lab, right? We want to have the computation low. Now the question is, will it work or not? As it turns out, it works really well. So these, this is a simple matrix. This is not a neural network. This is a simple matrix. It gets multiplied with the states, and that gives me the actions, right? And this action gets applied to the robot, right? In other words, this action gives me that trajectory that needs to be tracked eventually, correct? Now, in order to do this, so how will I learn this matrix? What is the best way to learn this matrix? Using evolutionary methods. So what is that? So let's say I start with one parameter. So you can think of theta as the parameter of this matrix, representing this matrix, right? Uh, so I will try, let's say, n different parameters, right? You can think of it as a random search technique, brute force technique. You try n different parameters you look at the rewards of those different parameters, you keep only the good ones and kill the bad ones, right? So now you see why we call it evolutionary, right? We kill all the bad ones. We take only the good ones and come up with a better linear policy, right? 
So I'm not sure how much of it you'll be able to grasp, but this is like the overall approach used in our, uh, in our walking. And the result of that is this walking behavior. So all the walking that you saw until now is all a process of this, is a result of this. Right? Okay, so I'm coming towards the end of the talk, so maybe I'll have five more minutes. If you have any questions, you can stop me anytime. Yes? If you look at the walk uh, of a robot versus a human, it's it's a much smoother walk. I mean, for the human compared to the robot, which is a jerky uh, kind of motion. So, do do people who study robots try to emulate that the, the smoothness which comes from muscles? Okay, so good one. So there is a huge community within the walking community itself. They are, they are entirely focused on biomechanics. We call it the biomechanics, where they look at non-traditional actuation techniques. So here we use motors, because that's the best that we have. But people are actually looking at, uh, you know, different types of actuations that emulate a muscle fiber, for example, right? Because the muscle fibers are not really, they are not even rotational in nature. It's like, you know, bending, twisting, all those kinds of behaviors, right? So those, there is a huge line of activities going in that direction. Uh, and that is mainly on trying to identify good actuators for uh, all these kinds of robots, robot platforms. People use uh, smart materials, for example, different types of materials to get that kind of an actuation. Uh, but in our lab, it would be great if we can get that kind of an actuator. We have not really seen a good enough actuator that we can deploy. But we simply use the best actuator that is available to us and try to get good behaviors. Right? It's possible that, you know, if we are able to come up with a better actuator, similar to the muscle fibers, we might get better walking. That is definitely there. And there is a huge biomechanics community that is focused on that. Questions? Yeah. Uh, instead of using an, a few large motors, is it possible to use a huge number of micro motors? Does the design of a micro motor exist? There is a motor that works with very small power, but you're using a large number of them to generate the power that you need. Then it'll have more uh, flexibility in the sense of applying more delicate forces. So, yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting direction. I have not really thought about it. So you can think of all these small, small motors moving maybe one string at a time maybe. Yeah. Uh, and then that, the result of that is a huge variation of the resulting legs, right? So. Yeah. We have a joint and we don't really put a motor at the joint. Maybe we pull some strings there and we connect those strings to a bunch of small motors and a nice coordination of those different motors will result in interesting behaviors. Yeah, that is something worth looking at. Uh, but why am I not looking at it? <laughs> um, I'm, my goal is to keep the, the number of actuators as small as possible, right? So we have 12. If you look at this robot itself, we have 12 actuators. And I want to keep it at 12. I don't want to increase it anymore, right? More actuators means more controllers. And the compute also increases. So a lot of other factors, right? So a lot of these things will come in. Here, I want to have only one motor for a joint. And then I will send the commands accordingly, right? If I can use two motors for three joints, that is also better, because I will have fewer actuators to work with. But it's very difficult to do that using that. Other questions? Oh, there are questions here. Yeah. The neural network part of this is that, like, you know, if it is a success, then um, based on that, you change the weights towards that success. So there is no training set, like you made a dog walk successfully and took some parameters on successful parameters and then trained the robot, like, with the training set of a dog's successful walk. Like, that's not. Okay, true. very good question. Uh, yeah, so you think of examples, right? Like classification is one great area. So you have these examples, you train it for that, and you, you, and you get a set of parameters, and it should work anywhere, right? You're trying to give that analogy. Here, the robot itself will, 
the properties of the robot itself will change over time. Today I will have this robot with some friction parameters. Tomorrow the friction parameters will be completely different. It's also possible that, you know, today the leg is not really bending, tomorrow it is bending, right? And uh, in the process of that, you'll end up, uh, you'll end up replacing the entire link itself, right? A lot of engineering is going on. I'm not happy with this leg, so let me replace the leg. Now the properties will be different, right? So it's not really possible to, uh, let's say that, you know, we cannot keep the parameters constant for a robot, right? First of all, it's hard for me to get a replica of a robot. And even if I get a replica of a robot, it will not be exactly, the model parameters are not exactly equal to that parameters, right? This is not the case when it comes to, it's not that big of a problem when it comes to image classification or NLP or those areas, right? So that's why I keep saying we have a model in a simulator and it seems to work very well in that simulator, right? And that model is a constant model, right? I download it here. Or I, don't, or I go to Australia and download that model, same model, the model is exactly the same. There is no difference, right? I purchase a robot here and I purchase a robot in Australia, the parameters are completely different. And that actually shows you'll be able to see the difference, right? The controllers will change. Also, uh, so reinforcement learning then is developing a successful walk. If you want a human-like walk, how do we know that, like, why would this give us, it, this, will give, this would give us like a walk, right? Is it human-like? Okay, so this human-like, right? The, the, these two words, uh, we can't define what human-like means because we don't know what we are trying to optimize. Even if we tend to believe that we are, when we are walking, we are trying to optimize something. Maybe it's a function of time, function of energy, a lot of other things, right? Re durability and so on and so forth. We don't know what we are trying to optimize. So human-like itself, the word itself is, you know, debatable, right? So we don't know what is actually human-like. So when that is a big question mark, right? Whatever gate we get in the robot, we can, we can say, okay, it looks like it is walking like a human, but that is the farthest that we can get. We cannot mathematically define, for example. We cannot give a metric for that. It's very difficult. But if it is efficient, it's good enough for me, right? Here also, you know, the, the goal is not really to get human-like behaviors, right? Even if we, uh, even if you look at humans as reference points, right? We are not really looking at human-like behaviors. We ultimate goal is to have efficient behaviors, right? Ultimate goal is what? Robot greater than or equal to human, right? So even if it becomes better than a human, it's fine. Now there also it's a big question mark in terms of what? Better than a human in terms of what? Right? <laughs> yeah. So my question was majorly about the uh, reinforcement techniques you're using. So uh, when you're simulating the whole thing in a computer and you mm. are changing the model based on that, creating a model based on that, what kind of terrain do you use? Do you use like different terrains or the same flat surface as shown in the simulation? Oh yeah, so we have tried different types of terrains flat terrains, upslope, downslope, I, I will show that. Uh, I will show it eventually. Uh, we also have terrains with stones, for example, rough terrain. We also have sand type of terrains. We have tested it on different terrains, but it's not comprehensive. It's not. So, uh, so does one model work on all terrains or do you train different models for different type of terrains and adapt to that model when that kind of terrain is like found in the robot? Yeah, so we try to find one controller that works on a range of terrains. Okay, so the best optimal choice yes, which yes. works on everything. Yes. Okay, got it. Yeah. Uh, can these robots can uh, style the, I mean, climb these tires and down these tires also? This robot? Huh. Not this robot. We are in the process of doing that, but not yet. Sir, is the length of the... It's uh, not strong enough. The motors are kind of weak. The length of the robots is fixed, or uh, it, it it is adjustable. Like uh, when you are when we when you were explaining about the capture points, uh, like if we have to turn towards the right, we take a, a, a big step to, uh, from the left leg. Is this the same case, or uh, it has some other? Mechanism? Yeah, the capture point will change based on your morphology, your uh, link lengths. It also depends on your torso weight. A lot of factors. 
it is a very model dependent uh, methodology. Other questions? Yeah. not drones even the motor based like our other wheel based stuff. So is there something in between uh, the wheel based stuff versus the walking can which can actually help better locomotive and then you could get into the robot quickly. <laughs> oh we can have legs with wheels maybe. But, but again, we don't have to worry about the stepping. But, but that, that becomes generally wheel based only right. I mean, yeah, but it's at least you have, you can think of it as an active suspension. You know, okay. uh, suspension is small, but here you can have a longer range. But I think because the, the major uh, challenge which we are solving with the walking robot is the terrain, right? Otherwise you could actually go with the wheels only. That's true, that's true. Yeah, so therefore like that's what I'm telling is, is there anything in between which could probably make the solution oh, you mean, come out uh, quickly? We can think of these, you know, tracked vehicles like the tanks. Oh, okay. The mm -hmm. tanks are a good uh, replacement, but they are very energy intensive. They consume a lot of energy. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Tanks are a good example. Yeah. Yeah. I was surprised that all the uh, other labs you mentioned were US based. Um, wh where is India in terms of uh, doing something like uh, Boston? Uh, lab did and what about the other countries what are they up to so i showed japan i showed europe the honda one yeah i didn't talk about china china is also there big player yeah europe uh, you saw that animal okay i need to i talked about animal right that is from europe So this is, sorry. So the, yeah, the one on the right is from Europe, right? Not only that, uh, zero moment point is from Europe. Capture point is from the US, Raybird is from the US. And a lot of techniques, all variants of these are from different countries, right? And like DARPA did with uh, Boston Group, not Boston Group, Boston so Labs. Um, is the Indian government also doing something similar? Do we have initiatives like that being encouraged in India or startups involved in that? Uh, so that, um, I don't know if there is, a, I don't think there is a DARPA equivalent uh, in India. So there is a DRDO and DRDO has a lot of projects in this domain. Uh, but uh, DARPA is, I think is different from DRDO. I think DARPA is mainly focused on advanced research projects, right? DRDO is not focused on advanced, but now I think they have started looking at it. DARPA is mainly for futuristic type of research. They, they don't look at five years down the line, 10 years down the line. They want to look at 30 years or even longer, right? L long term directions. And that's where they got the funding from. But I think there is, there are talks of creating a DARPA like organization in this country. It's a big requirement. Yeah, things are happening. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned, yeah, we developed this controller in IAC, right? So by the way, we have deployed the same controller in uh, the US, so I will talk about this. So we have actually deployed this controller on, a, on this robot called Digit. Digit is again a US company made robot. Uh, it's a two-legged robot, not a four-legged robot. Uh, so we have used linear policies, and this is in collaboration with uh, my colleague at Ohio State, uh, yeah, it's going to play. So here the linear policies are working and it is working on a range of slopes. So here we are seeing uh, upslope, uh, staircases, uh, varying slopes, uh, downslope walking. So it's able to work, walk comfortably in all of these terrains, right? And we have also tested it, it on hardware. So we, we made this walking for continuously for 15 minutes, right? Uh, and here it's able to walk on these uh, elevations 
forward walk, forward walking, backward walking, turning, lateral directions also. Okay. Yeah, sure. If you put the ears for balance while walking, is there a corresponding device in these things? Yes, we have an inertial measuring unit for that. It measures the, the roll pitch and your, so it measures the orientation. It's a yes. Yeah, it's similar to what you have in your phone. In your phone also you have these inertial units, right? It's the same sensor that we use. Uh, so in digit we have, um, so we have the joint angle measurements which are from the motors. So, so if you have 10 motors then you will have 10 angle measurements, right? And then you will have an inertial measurement which is the, the torso one. And uh, in some cases we can also have other types of sensors like LIDARs, cameras and that is mainly to, you know, estimate your environment for that. Yeah, so in the environment itself, we are trying to, you know, play with the slopes, up slope, down slope, walking, and the robot has to go on, go there, right? And we don't tell the robot if it's an up slope or a down slope. We tell the robot, you just have to cross that barrier, if you want to call it, right? And we there is a reward for that. And using that, it's able to learn that it has to go up the slope, go down the slope, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yes, yes, correct. Yeah, yeah, so we read these parameters and we tell the robot, okay, if you are able to navigate this terrain, uh, we will give you a high reward. And it's able to figure out how to do that. Yeah, so it's a, it's a lot of trial and error. It has to keep on trying, trying until it finds a good one, right? Yeah. Okay, good one. Uh, we do, so we use distance traveled, that is one. Uh, distance traveled as in how much distance it has traveled, right? So the, la the larger it is, then better it is, right? More the reward. Uh, we also look at uh, the oscillation, the, ro the torso should not oscillate too much. It should not be like this walking, right? It has to be very steady. So we penalize the velocities of the torso, right? Uh, we also look at uh, the energy consumed, actually. We, we try to limit the, the power energy consumed uh, in each of the joints, right? So we have a lot of these, you know, terms. We have like, I think, six or seven terms in that reward. And... Uh, no, these are the rewards. These are the rewards. So the oscillation should not be too much. So you need to make sure that the magnitude is as small as possible, right? So let's say torso pitch velocity, right? Pitch is something like this. You look at the magnitude of that pitch, right? And you need to make sure that it is as small as possible. So you, your reward is like minus the magnitude of the pitch velocity, right? And for every time step, you will measure the pitch velocity. You add all of them together. And that has to be as small as possible. So that is one example. Another example is, you know, I, I traveled by two meters. Two meters is like a reward for it. I traveled by five meters. That's even more, right? So those types of rewards are also there. We will have to play with that. It's not that easy. And the moment we change the model, we will have to play with the rewards too. That is also there. And that's the reason why I keep saying, you get it working in a simulation does not mean you will have it working in the hardware. They play a huge part. In fact, in the simulator, you don't model friction, for example. You don't model bending. You think that it is a rigid link. But in the actual hardware, there is, there is always going to be bending, right? Uh, some way or another. And that actually affects the entire walking itself. Think about it. You change the angle, the taller the robot, 
harder it is to get it to walk. Why? You change the angle by a small degrees, the, the, at the foot level, the distance mismatch is like a few centimeters, right? It's very, very hard. So a few centimeters is a big deal for this robot. The mechanics? Yeah, so we actually, um, for the two-legged robot, uh, we, we assume that the, the, the thigh mass is actually significant and we somehow take into account that, uh, that information, right? For a four-legged robot, we, we say that the masses, in fact, you can actually see that the masses of the legs are very small compared to the mass of the torso. But that is not the case for, the, for a two-legged robot. So I agree, the controllers are also actually changing. So your uh, control structure will be a little different. Your rewards will also be a little different. So there are ways how you can play with that. Because if you look at the number of uh, training episodes that is required to learn this, it is in uh, millions, right? A million iteration is possible in a simulator. In fact, that's how Google achieved, uh, uh, you know, Google achieved that walking, right? Humanoid walking in a simulator. They have used billions of parameters to get that happen, make that happen, right? So that's a lot of iterations. If you're talking about a million iterations in the real life, <laughs> I will be long dead <laughs> by the time we achieve learning. So if, if, if we have trained something on a simulation, then we fine tune for some epochs on. That's what we try to do. We try to learn in hardware also, but uh, so far, uh, you know, it has been quite very hard because we do one run, right? And uh, if the hardware is not reliable, you know, we'll have to do it multiple times because every time, you know, this motor fails, oh, now the data that you've received is wrong, right? Oh, IME sensor is not working right now. Right? Again, the data that you've received is wrong. So everything has to be working properly and you get one run and then you can use that data. But to get that one run data is like uh, half a day right now. So think about it, 100 episodes means what? 50 days, 50 working days. So nothing compared to simulators. Simulators are like you simply press enter, <laughs> it starts simulating. Here, uh, you have to make sure that you have the e-stop ready, emergency stop. You have to make sure that the battery is charged fully. You have to make sure that the controller software is loaded completely, no errors. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, the links, chains are all in place. The screws are all tightened properly. Uh, everything, you know, a lot of these factors, even if you change a screw, it will affect the, the way it works. In, in fact, that is true even uh, for the smaller robot, actually. So we, there was one screw that was very loose and that was causing a lot of play and uh, the walking was completely different, <laughs> right? So all these things happen. So we, we seem to underestimate uh, the hardware controllers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even the terrain, we think that this is a flat terrain, but for a robot, this may not really be a flat terrain, right? So in a simulator, flat means flat, like there is not even a micrometer change in the levels. And that, does that play a role? Yes, it does. In fact, it does. So we call this a flat terrain because we don't seem to, you know, differentiate between this and uh, another terrain, right, which is like very uniform. But it, it makes a big difference. Not only that, even the friction conditions, we assume unif uniform friction in a simulator. But here the frictions could be different at different, different places, right? So all these things are very important. So we don't, we don't account for all environmental realities in a simulator. That is the bottom line. And that's the reason why we don't really, we are not really able to get, uh, translate these controllers that are working in a simulator into the hardware. Can you try to flip this meaning? It's very hard to make hardware like a simulator, but these days I would imagine it's not so difficult to make the simulator like a hardware. Meaning get a camera to watch your robot and try to get the simulator to correctly simulate the robot and then 
train on that environment. I don't know if, are people trying this? The, so there the problem is we have to run, how many times do we have to run this robot? Ah, okay, yeah, that's right. That's right. But still with the video. Even the digital twins, yeah, there are issues. Ah, yeah, so you need the data from We have to run so running. many times. Yeah, but at least you can try to improve the simulation to make it more we like can definitely the hardware do it. rather than the other way around. Yes, we, we keep on playing with the parameters. We keep on adjusting the parameters. Like here, right, we have this robot here in the real world, the simulator. We try to close the gap, but uh, we are still not there, but really. Doing the closing the gap by changing the sim hardware, I'm saying it may be easier to change the software. by. Yeah, we, we change the software parameters, yes, okay. yes. So we change the friction parameters here on the legs, right? We do all sorts of things. Yeah, we don't have enough runs of the robot to get an accurate information. Not only that, the parameters that you see today are not equal to the parameters that you see tomorrow. That is another problem, right? So despite all of these differences, we try to use a simulator. We also use the hardware and try to balance between the two. Oh, so, oh, okay, because then we can, no, uh, so it's the same analogy between animals and us. We use our hands for all of uh, the other tasks and that's the reason why we are more advanced oh. than animals, right? So even, uh, we, we want to keep the same number of motors. Think of it that way. We want to keep the same same hardware. And we want to replace these two legs with, with arms so that we can think of doing other types of tasks. All right? So that is the, the analogy. Right? So we can say that a two-legged robot is more, perhaps more intelligent than a... Yeah, that is more motors, right? So more motors means more... more yeah. Certainly, yeah. Also means lesser sleepless nights for me and my students. <laughs> Have people tried like uh, fusing classical methods itself in reinforcement learning during the training time rather than doing it post? Yeah, that's what we do actually. Uh, in fact, I showed model predictive control, right? I didn't want to get into the detail of that. We actually incorporate MPC, model predictive control, and then get data from that and train it on this hardware. And that reduces the number of training iterations from several millions to thousands. So there is a big jump. But having said that, we say classical methods, right? A lot of the classical methods are model-based methods. Model is required. Now again, how good a controller that is, is dependent on the model that you have used, right? If you don't use a good model, again, that controller will not work in the hardware. Again, the same problem. So simulation to reality gap is not just in training in reinforcement learning. It is also there in classical methodologies. Okay, <laughs> good question. I think it is, uh, if you're talking about flying with the wings instead of rotors, I think it is harder with wings, right? Uh, I think it's the same analogy, like having a rotational component, just having a rotary component is easier than having, you know, like a entire robot changing its entire morphology, right? Having a wheeled robot is better than a, easier than having a legged robot. It's the same analogy, right? So you can think of it as the number of parts. The moment you increase the number of moving parts, the harder it is going to be. Swimming also, if you're talking about snake, I think that is hard. But if you have <laughs> one boat with one propeller, then I think it is easy. <laughs> uh, one more follow-up to that. So going from uh, reinforcement learning program or like whatever model we have built there, what is your usual process of getting into real life? Like what is the, like do you test it on one leg and then verify, that, okay, so the model is working correctly now and then start off with uh, four legs or how, how does the process look like for you in yeah, your yeah. lab? Oh, 
uh, yeah, good one. So we actually, this leg, right? So we started with one leg, and we actually measure all the torques, torque curves, speed curves. We do all these kinds of analysis. It also dep depends on the motors that we use, right? We also look at uh, the, the speed, angular velocity of each and every link. We try to see how much peak torque it can apply, right? And we also look at other types of analysis, like the stress analysis on the links. The link should not break, right, under a stress. So we do all these sorts of analysis on one leg. And once we are happy with that, we go with multiple legs and put it on the robot. So that is like the normal procedure. And then overall, how do you test the model? And how do you verify, OK, so the learnings from reinforcement, are they matching here? And if not, then how do you go about tweaking that? Oh, yeah, we look at the data. So we look at the trajectories of the legs. So we compare it with the trajectories that we get in the simulator, and we see what the gap is. We can't fit them exactly because we know there is a difference, but we try to bring it down. We try to bring it down. So we try to reduce the gap between these two trajectories. We definitely look at all the trajectories, including the joints, torso angles, torso velocities, joint angles, joint velocities, all of that we will compare it with the simulator data. So this tweaking is done on the parameter side of the controls or you tweak it on other places as well? No, we actually, okay, so one way of looking at it is um, we, we try to measure the model parameters of this robot using the trajectories, right? And then we incorporate these model parameters into the simulator. We don't do it all the time, but whenever we feel that, you know, there is a difference. For example, mass of the torso. We change the battery, the, ma the mass will change. Because today we will be using a 20 mAh, uh, sorry, 20,000 mAh battery. Tomorrow it will be a 22,000 mAh battery because there was no stock. 20,000 was out of stock, right? The mass is different. Now what do we do? We try to measure that and we see, okay, this is, there is an increase in the mass. Not only that, there is an increase in the other inertial properties of this torso, right? Uh, for example, you know, the inertia along this direction, inertia along this direction. So all these things we try to measure and then we try to incorporate it as much as possible to the best way possible. But uh, sometimes, you know, we, we can't keep doing this all the time. We, if there is an error of, say, let's say 100 grams or 200 grams, we try to ignore it. And then we focus more on trying to get a good controller, right? So we'll have to balance it because every time we try to model that robot, it means that we spend a few extra days on getting those parameters, right? Other questions? Yeah. So typically it is uh, six to seven kilometers per hour. Mm -hmm. So is there a, a similar limitation here with robots as well? Because yes, yes, we can always do that. So the way to do this, I mean, the, the, we, we do this in a very crude way. So we look at the max speed of the joint, the hip joint. Max speed of this joint, and we have the walking height. So we know the, the possible speed of this end foot, right? And that is like the max speed of the robot. So can right? we uh, keep on increasing the walking speed? Yeah, so the way to do that is by actually <laughs> changing the motor itself. Okay. Yeah, but we have never hit the peak uh, speed with this robot. I think the motors that we have used here are actually very fast, super so fast. With, with bipeds, one condition for walking is that one foot is always grounded, while the other one is uh, lifted up in the air. So with humans, you have uh, an upper limit of about six to seven kilometers per hour. That's a walking, maximum walking speed. So does a similar thing apply to these robots as well? Oh. Yeah. Or can you beat that record and make it faster? Because there yeah, I think we can. Because that optimization of comes from the fact that this V squared by L cannot be greater than G. The acceleration uh -huh. due to gravity. So how do you get around that problem? Acceleration, so the gravity comes into the picture. That will limit the speed, you're saying? Yes, yes, it should. Because one foot has to be grounded for walking gait. Hmm. So for how long the other foot is in the air is decided by G. Pendulum. Like an inverted pendulum. Well, I don't know how you, I need to understand that calculation again. 
maybe we can discuss this outside. Yeah, sure, sure. yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we'll do that. But uh, I don't know how you, uh, anyways, maybe we can discuss this outside the stock. I just wanted to know if it, if it can walk faster than what the It is possible to get possible. Uh, fast walking speeds. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. But I don't think it has to do with the gravity. That is my, hmm? So, uh, Professor Shishir, so. Uh, maybe you're referring to running, no? Beyond a certain speed, you have to start running, not walking. Oh, that's what you're saying. Okay. In terms of efficiency, like if you have a flat surface and you hmm. want the robot to move from point A to point B, is a wheeled robot more efficient than a walking robot or is the other way around? The wheeled is always efficient. Okay. The wheeled robot is always efficient, uh, more efficient than a walking robot. So if you have a flat terrain, you should be using a wheeled robot, not a walking robot. Yeah, that is always a fact. Because you have a lot of moving parts here, right? How many wheels do you need to go forward? Four wheels. Here you have 12, three times more. It's a big jump. So, uh, and if I you're talking about using uh, micro motors, then I don't know <laughs> what the jump will be. <laughs> yeah, 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 true. Cars are very efficient because you know, they have wheels, right? Rotational. So they're very efficient on a flat terrain. So if you have a good road, then you should be using wheels, not a walking type of a mechanism. Yeah, sorry, there was another question. No questions here, right? We have, we have some online oh. questions. Oh, so, okay. And also I would request people to raise their hand and ask the question. So should I go to the sure. online questions? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, Abhishek S. is asking, um, when you say it has to figure out a ellipse, then what does a robot does? Does it follow a small section of best ellipse at each step of, at each step to move? Oh, okay, so that ellipse was actually representational. We actually follow curves. So should I show that? You know, I just wanted to come up with, show a simpler curve first and then keep on making it more and more complex. So if we are actually using splines, we are using cubic polynomials for the entire, yeah, I think when you showed that it has to figure out the trajectory, uh, should I repeat the question once? Sure, yeah. So when you say it has to figure out the ellipse, then what does the robot does? Does it follow a small section of best ellipse at each step to move? Okay. Okay, so we have this, so he is talking about the section of this each ellipse, right? Uh, so we, so there are, points, so these are the different, so this is one section of the ellipse, right? Actually, there are points here on this ellipse. Uh, so we are actually having a spline or, or a polynomial that is connecting these points, right? And we shape these points, we, we shape these polynomials. That is number one. We also play with the length of this, the radius. So we do a lot of these things to just to get a good trajectory. So it's not just an ellipse, it's actually a set of polynomials all stitched together. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is by um, Manavi Nannan. Uh, could you suggest a good intro paper to understand RL method as applied in walking robots? Mm. Okay, I can probably send some links later on, maybe after this lecture. Or I can email you, perhaps. So there is another question someone asked uh, in the audience here. In Center for AI and Robotics Care, C-A-I-R-D-R-D-O, are there any works going on in this area of walking robots? Um, need to check with the care. <laughs> <Dear dear. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> So there is a question by Naman. Would a generalized controller ever exist, which is agnostic to the robot design? If yes, how long would it probably take? Generalized controller across all, so when, when you say generalize, he is referring to, he or she referring to two-legged, four-legged, that generalization or a range of four-legged robots? That is the generalization? 
just says generalized controller ever exists. Maybe for say four. It does not. Just okay. as a so use case, you can think of four four legged. So the framework yes can be generalized, and that's what we have done: two legged versus four legged. But I don't think you know we can have one controller that fits all robots. I don't think that is possible. So there is a question: uh, Do you use in-house software or common software like? ANSYS SOLIDWORKS for simulations. Do you do you we use, use in-house software or common software like SOLIDWORKS ANSYS for simulations? We use SOLIDWORKS. Use. <laughs> so but I think you use I think other use, softwares as well, which are Yeah, I think it's referring to okay. So we use okay. Let me talk about the softwares that are in use. Uh, we use uh, ROS, standard platform. ROS stands for Robot Operating System. Uh, and uh, we use existing libraries, actually, for, for the sensors, right? We use existing libraries that are already there. Uh, we have uh, the motor controller, actually, is uh, from an open source platform. Uh, I can give the details if they are interested. It's actually from an open source platform. Uh, it's called MJBots. So we use MJBot software also. So yeah, a bunch of softwares, which are mostly open source that we use. So I'll take a last question online. Uh, Monak Day is asking, is nonlinear trajectory planning, in nonlinear trajectory planning, we always say that the problem is strongly nonlinear. How do we judge whether the nonlinearity -line of a problem is strong or weak? Nonlinearity of a problem is strong or weak? There is nothing like a nonlinear problem a system is linear or nonlinear. It's a binary, actually. System, you know, we say a dynamical system is a, either a linear system or a nonlinear system, right? Uh, in fact, nonlinear, uh, the word itself is sending a wrong message, actually. No, nonlinear means it's not linear. Uh, it's not actually true. Nonlinear means not necessarily linear, right? Uh, so. So when I, when I have to be mathematically accurate, I have to say a system is either linear or it is not linear, right? Nonlinear also includes <laughs> linear systems. It's a binary, actually. Thank you. That's it, the online question. Any other questions here? Oh, there's a question there, yeah. So, uh, though this might uh, increase the compute, but uh, is it so? Since you are using libraries like ROS and stuff, where you simply give, you want to go to this coordinate, you go to that coordinate. Uh, APIs handle that on their own. Uh, but what if the controller took into account what is the friction or of that joint or you know, increasing the st uh, state space to decide what actions to take. Would that help bridge the gap between simulation and uh, real world? Because your controller would be agnostic to such changes. Yeah, the problem with friction is that it's very hard to measure friction more than anything else. And even if I measure some value today, tomorrow it will be something else. And uh, how can I measure it? I, I don't think I can measure it in measure it on the fly. Yeah, I cannot I mean, measure it in real time. I will some, have to some byproduct of friction. Uh, let's say how much of energy do you have to give to get some amount of motion in a joint? It's not only friction that we are talking about. We are talking about motor losses also. For example, we have eddy currents. If you have heard of eddy currents, right? It, it is a function of a lot of things. I just mentioned friction, but there are multiple other factors. Uh, that keep affecting. So can we not uh, expand the st state space to make our controller agnostic to such changes? Um, but anyways, uh, okay, this is a very complex question. You're going more towards adaptive control maybe. Yeah. yeah. So I think this makes the case for really what can is I? Problem. So, okay, before we conclude, I just wanted to one, show one final video. Uh, okay, thanks to the team. I just wanted to mention this, you know, it's not just me. 
the team is actually more, more important than myself. Without the team, this would not have been possible. I just wanted to conclude with one final video and then we can close. So this is stock three walking robot. So we developed this uh, again two, three months ago. We, we deployed the controller two, three months ago. And uh, we, we actually demonstrate walking on different terrains. In fact, uh, on grass, on concrete. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, so this, this was actually very interesting. We didn't call the dogs. The dogs came by themselves. They were like, who is this <laughs> new competitor? <laughs> okay, so with that, Thank you for listening. I must say we had a lot of questions and a lot of discussion. And I think uh, some of your curiosity has been satisfied. But the rest can be done over coffee, I suggest. But meanwhile, I'd like to give Shishi the Thank you. token Thanks of our appreciation for this effort he has put in. Thanks a lot. Thank you.